I sent for everyone because no coffee before teaching. In fact, it's a good idea to talk a little bit about. You know, as soon as you receive the Holy Communion, let's let's um, talk about what's going on there. When I receive the Holy Mysteries, right, I'm alive, I'm new, I'm renewed, I'm a new person. And I should stay in the temple and settle myself for a while. Certainly at least until, you know, the dismissal time. Try to settle yourselves. Like, not um, to rush out and forget what just happened, which is a divine revelation to my whole person, to my whole temple, right? Oh, I, lost, I lost my mind there for a minute. I thought I would go get coffee instead. You, you see? You get there. And that's kind of like the spirit of, of what I want to say here, because in this gospel, Christ says something significant, and sometimes it's misinterpreted. You know in this gospel, do you remember what it was? Where he uh, casts out demons, and they're asking him why. Why couldn't we do this thing? And he says, no faith. <laughs> no faith. But before that, they come and they say, this one has a demon, and you know, and the Lord says this very striking line. You know, you know, he's not always like mild, meek, and mild. How do they say it? Jesus and calm. And he says, "How long do I have to be with you? How long do I, in the old translation it's how long do I have to suffer you? How long do I have to like be here for everybody?" It's a beautiful line, and here's the misinterpretation. It's not a sin. The Lord is not angry there. The Lord is not like attacking there. Like that might be the interpretation of someone who's sinning in their interpretation. The Lord is actually, you know, it shows the beautiful wedding of the divine nature and the human nature. Because in his human nature, he was tired. Sometimes the Lord got tired. It even says it in the Gospel. He went into a mountain to rest, or on a boat to go to sleep in a storm, you know, or he just needed, as a human being, some, some rest and some quiet, you know, which we all need. So at this time, like, they're bringing him all their demons. It's a good analogy, it's a good icon, if you will. They're bringing him all their demons, and this one has a demon, and this one. And this one throws himself into the fire, my son. And you know, and we have a million problems. Why? Because we have a million demons all around us and inside of us. And the beauty of it is, we don't ever have to panic. There's a lot of garbage going on out there and in here, by the way. We can't just point the finger until we look at this one first. There's a lot of, of um, evil evil, demonic things going on. And look, the Lord gives us the simple teaching. Do this, and you will live. Don't do this, and you will live. Do you want to live? Do this. And, and, and so, just read into this. We have demons. This one, and this one, he says, look, I told you a million times, if you live like this, you'll live. If you live like this, you won't. So how, now you get it, how long do I have to be with you? Like in other words, do I have to be with you forever? Just because you forget, like in a minute, the teaching? So he says it as a teaching device. He says it for them. He says, please, please, my beloved ones, I'm not going to be with you forever. Like he says in another place, you're not going to have the Son of Man forever. And you know how we know that this interpretation is of the truth of the church? It's because right at the end of this gospel, look at how the church puts this gospel together on this Sunday. After all of that, the casting out demons, he kind of puts a little punctuation on the end. Do you remember what the last one says? The Son of Man will soon be delivered into the hands of sinful men. That's the end of the gospel, right? And they will crucify him and kill him. So, so I'm not going to be with you forever. For instance, you know, i.e., the Son of Man will be crucified, you see? So, alert. Let's get ready. Let's fight the good fight, basically. So we have, like, 
other places where the like, what about the greatest one ever born of woman? Who is it? Yeah. St. John the Baptist. St. John says at the end, like near the end, before he gets arrested, he says, no, 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 no. It's not about this life. I must decrease and he must increase. This is the same kind of spirit. He's saying, like, I've accomplished exactly what I was supposed to do. Do you know how we know that, in fact? He doesn't go following Christ. There was a little period of time there. Do you remember after he baptized him? After the 40-day temptation in the wilderness? Christ is teaching. And John continues to teach and continues to baptize in that place. Why doesn't he go and follow the Master? He sends his disciples. He says, go and follow him now. I must decrease. He must decrease. Because he knew that, you know, I've accomplished what God sent me to do. I've accomplished what my life's work has been. And he could have said at that point too, how, much, how long do I have to be with you? How long do I have to suffer you? Right? That's exactly what Christ says. But he says it in that spirit of detachment. That spirit of release. Hey, go, go forth. Go forth. You know? You have all the power to accomplish many things. You know, like Hannah was just baptized last week, right? Now Hannah, with the grace of the holy baptism, like with all this energy from the Holy Spirit that's coming into you out of every minute, right? You can accomplish already great things like you couldn't accomplish last week. I promise. Now you can, like it says in that gospel, say to that mountain, move from there to there. See? And if you have that kind of faith, now you have the grace to, to cooperate with that faith. Oh my gosh, anything is possible for the Christian. Anything. Any kind of healing, any kind of restoration, any kind of fighting against the evil one. You know, turning your back on all the old stuff. It's a beautiful gift. And so Christ, now that he's in you, and the Holy Spirit is in you, right? They don't have to be in, like standing in front of you all the time teaching, 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 and telling you everything. And you know, I'll give you one more example. Do you remember the life of the theologian, St. John the Theologian? It's one of the greatest stories. If you've never read his life, it's filled with every kind of persecution and misery and joy and everything. It's a long life. Of all the apostles, it's the longest. So when he's near the end of his life, He's ready to go. He basically says, I'm, go I'm going now. He tells them, how long do I have to be with you? I can't stay here. He's an old man. They drag him up here, like, just so that the people can, like, hear something from him. He's old. He's almost 100 years old. And he looks at them, and he's weeping. And all he can muster up the strength to say is, little children love each other. And then they push him back into his chair, you know. How long do you want people to live? How long do you want a teacher to live? Right? This is the idea. So John the theologian, John the theologian, when he's ready to give up the spirit, look what happens. They beg him not to go. They say, stay with us. And he's ready to leave this life. They say, stay with us. He says, no, no, no. It's time for me to go. I want to be with my master. All the apostles are gone. And all that first generation, gone. And he says, I have to go too. And he says, no, no. And they're weeping and they're crying. And then they beg him, at least leave us the written legacy. Like, write down all the things that you've taught us. And so what does he do? He goes out to the cave and he starts dictating the gospel to Prochorus, his disciple. He goes into the trance. And then he says, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, and the word, and for three days, the whole gospel. And then he says, finally, now will you let me leave? You know, finally, now can I depart in peace? And look, even then, how he reposes. They dig his grave, they dig it up to his knees. And then they're hugging him, and they're embracing him, and they're weeping. And he says, now cover me up to the neck, so that just his head is like, and they're embracing his head and they're kissing his neck. And, and then finally he gives up the spirit and then they completely bury him. Even to the last second, the poor, a 
Apostle John couldn't have a moment's peace to say, now into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. But that was his life. That's why he's John, the beloved one, you know, because he was filled with love and filled with joy all the time. But all of that, from John the Baptist to the Lord himself, to St. John, to every saint, every saint, at some point, they, they said, you know, my time is completed now. My time is completed. It's a good thing now for me to accomplish, to have accomplished everything. Lord, I was, I, receive me into your heaven, please. What a beautiful thing. So if Christ can say, and the two great apostles, like John the greatest and John the theologian, they could say, you know, it's time for me to go down. It's time for me to, you know, for the Lord to be exalted. And the Lord to even say, really, my teaching is finished. What more can I give you? And here's the sort of little stinger, if you will. It's not his teaching, but it's a little bit of a rebuke. He exhorts them. He says, how long must I be with you? In other words, are you ever going to get it? Are you ever going to hear the teaching? So Orthodox Christians, right? Are you ever going to finally get it? Am I ever going to finally get it before I leave this life? That's, a, that's kind of the proverbial, perennial question that's always in front of us, right? As we raise our children, as we bury our loved ones, as we wed our loved ones to each other, next week we have a wedding, etc., etc. You know, like, what spirit are we, are we doing that in? How about this? What spirit are we living in? Right? There's all kinds of, as I said before, just demonic things happening. Inside of the church, in some cases, God, Lord, and mercy, and certainly outside of the church. All kinds of evils. We simply have to remember the teaching, and more importantly, practice the teaching. Live the life. Live the life. Right? It sounds so simple. But you watch. Now this week, how many attacks are going to come into my life? And into our lives? From the outside. And from the inside. And the devil's going to say, oh yeah, you think that it's like that? Watch this. He'll say, the Lord has to be with you to the very end. And he is, by the way. Not in the flesh, not incarnate, so to speak. But in the flesh, incarnate in the body and blood of Christ. That's why it's so important for us to try to stay in communion as much as we can. So that when I'm on my deathbed, Right? If I'm blessed enough to have a deathbed, one of the last things I want to do while I still have bodily function and strength is to partake of the body and blood of Christ. To be in His presence. Right? And then, then we can say, Lord, now I can go with you. Please take me with you. Please have mercy enough so that whatever is incomplete, whatever is lacking can be fulfilled, can be completed. This is what we mean when we say Christian ending to our life. Painless, blameless, peace. No distractions, no like looking this way and regrets and all that. We confess all that cleanly. We get rid of everything and we stay with the Lord. We stay with the Lord. Right? So that he doesn't have to say, God forbid we hear like at the judgment seat, how long did I have to be with you? How long did I have to suffer you? No. Instead we hear, welcome into my heavenly kingdom. You know, well done, good and faithful servant. These are the words of life. These are the words of joy. Okay? So, gain some strength from the fact that he left us his church. He left us his body here on earth. Gain strength from that because you can participate over and over and over again in repentance and, and in the, how should we say like the healing sustenance of our life, which is this liturgy, you know, which is this body and blood of Christ, for the salvation of our souls and for the glorification of God. If we do that consistently, faithfully, looking neither to the right nor to the left, and certainly not giving in to our passions. We talked about all that last week, right? All the horrible things that 
put the practice in your thing. Okay? All we have to do is stay like this. Stay the course. Stay the course. Another day. I might only have another day, so just do it another day. And then if you live that day, another day. And then have a week. Another week, you know. Okay, Lord, I can do this with your help. I can do this by not taking my eyes off of you. I can move a mountain, in fact. See, what happens is if you live that kind of life consistently, and if you're thinking like that, see, if you're not thinking, being pulled by the world's, like, uh, craziness, if you're thinking consistently, you'll have what, what we call in the spiritual life, sanity. It's a different definition than the, the psychological definition of sanity. Sanity in the kingdom of God is like this. This is sanity. This is normal. You know, wouldn't it be nice, I've said this before, just to stay in church all day, let's go eat something, and then we'll come back and we'll have another service. Maybe some confessions. Maybe some over here will be talking, like um, asking questions and talking about like some fathers. Maybe over here, all the live long day. Or every day. See? It's normal. I know, some people here would love that. They would be here like every minute. That's okay, because that's because there are people who want to, you know, give more and more and more of their hearts and their lives to Christ. That's not a bad thing. Because by the end of this life, that will be asked of you. That will be required of you. To give it all. To just surrender everything, right? And not to go out like reluctantly or like, uh, you know, crazily. To be at peace. So that starts now. Okay? Be at peace. When the Lord says, how long? Think about it in a different way. You could read the gospel like this. How long? How long do I have to be with you? Right? In a loving way. How long do I have to be with you? In a joyful way. How long do I have to suffer you? Right? I can see the Lord saying it like that with a smile. Even. With kindness and with a deep sense of he cares. He's not always like this. It's not like that. He cares. And he says, get ready, my dears. I'm not going to be with you forever. And so we'll continue that idea and say, you're not going to be here forever. So I'll take it in that spirit. Receive it in that spirit. And let's do something about it. There it is. Let's live. Let's really live. 